Thanks, everyone. Um, notice the title. It's Open Source Marketing for Hackers. I guess you could just as well call it um, Hacking for Open Source Marketeers, I guess. Um, is Indeed. <laughs> That's fine. Um, I'm not a marketing expert. At least I didn't start off one, and I, I wouldn't presume too much. I'm an engineer. I'm a hacker. Um, I work on the Apache Open Office project as my primary one. Actually, while I go to the next slide, intro, kind of basic thing. It's mainly talking about some tools and techniques I learned about marketing, especially ones that are kind of based on software, free software, tools you can use, some scripts, some ways that kind of make it fun from a hacker, but also are very effective, a little bit less kind of squishy, wishy-washy than the marketing people I talk to and kind of getting more down to actual measurement and looking at results, which is something I found attractive. Who am I? I'm from Westford, Massachusetts, out in New England. Uh, my contact information, PMC member on Apache Open Office and Incubator, uh, work for IBM. For most of my career, I, I pretty much held marketing people in, dis in disdain. I mean, the, I, I, how many people here are marketing people? Not a disdain, but... <laughs> but so sort of the people that you thought were, you know, they didn't write code. What, what else could be said? Um, and then when Open Office came to Apache, we really didn't have any people doing the marketing of it. And we were kind of losing out on the marketing side. We were doing good technical work, but weren't really expressing it in the marketplace of ideas, in the media, um, among bloggers and stuff. And, and I kind of sort of stepped up and said, well, this is something I might as well learn. It, it, you know, it can't be poisonous. Let's try to learn a little bit, bit about it. And especially, how do you apply it in a community open source project like Apache, where we're not going to go out and spend thousands of dollars, tens of thousands of do dollars on market surveys. We're not going to get locked into proprietary products that you know, have subscription fees. And you know, we have to keep in mind our, our nonprofit mission. So you know, how, how do you kind of connect those things? One of the first things we did is sat down and just try to figure out, you know, what is marketing? What does it mean for us? And the definition we came up with was from the perspective of the Apache Open Office Project, marketing is the set of activities our volunteers undertake to communicate the value and benefits of the Open Office Product, as well as the Open Office Project to potential users, the press, and potential project members. So we're not selling something. I mean, I mean, we all have kind of dual lives. We wear multiple hats. We work for corporations many times. We work in open source projects many times. From the perspective of the project, it's really about communicating value and benefits. It's not about selling something per se. So up on our website, we also have an important statement about how that relates to our mission as a nonprofit at Apache. And I don't know if you can see it. I can barely see it. So I'll read it. It says, marketing in a nonprofit organization. We need to make an important distinction between marketing in a nonprofit organization like Apache versus marketing in a commercial context. Most of the tools and activities are the same, as you may have noticed, but the orientation is different. Although users, you know, our users, have alternatives, we don't think of these alternatives as competitors. If a user decides another product serves them better, we've lost nothing. We count our wins, not our losses. So along with this orientation and the ASF's overall charitable mission, we place a high premium among the marketing volunteers on honesty, integrity, serving the public good, focus on our strengths, not on others' weaknesses, and marketing's not equal to competing against. Now sure, as in a pra practical context, someone's probably going to use either open office or an alternative. It is zero sum. Not many people sit around running five different office suites. But in terms of how we project our value and talk about things, we're not getting into the mud in terms of you know, bullet items, bullet lists, comparing features to other products and stuff like that. And we're trying to stick to this overall mission. So one of the important things to think about is, you know, we're talking about communicating the benefits and the capabilities, abilities of our software. And you kind of think of what are all the different ways that we influence the discussion of that. Um, you know, up here we have users. Well, users talk to other users via word of mouth. If users are happy about your product and think that it's a great thing and it's free, they're going to tell other users. And that's especially true today you know, with social media. So we'll talk later about things we did to make it easier for users to tell their friends about OpenOffice. That's a key part of it. You have up here the community, you know, the volunteers that are actually, and I'm not making, a, I know some Apache projects 
And in fact, it is true, users are part of the community. I'm making a slight distinction here between those who contribute directly to the creation of the product versus those that mainly consume it on the other end. But obviously, there's interaction here. The community, we have interactions with the users. We send them announcements and new releases. We have blog posts. We have incoming bug reports. We respond to those bug reports. So there's all sorts of influence going back and forth between community and users. We send out press releases to the press. Indirectly, maybe we get feedback you know, when we read articles, but it's, it's not as direct. Um, and obviously, the community, by creating the product, has a lot of influence. That influences the press as they review the product. It actually influences the users as they see the capabilities. And we'll look at kind of various ways you know, that a marketing effort at Apache can kind of get the most benefit out of those various kind of lines of influence. So a first kind of tool, a free tool I'd point out um, to anyone who hasn't seen it before is Google Alerts. This is a good way to get your kind of finger on the pulse of what people are saying about your product. Um, obviously, you, if you have a dev list, which you all presumably do on Apache projects, a user's list, many of you do, you'll hear there. Google Alerts is a way that you can get an email sent to you daily, weekly, immediately, whenever there's a conversation mentioning your product name. And you can go to google.com slash alerts, and you can set, and this is a free service, you know, set alerts for your product name, you know, its full name, as well as any shorter names it might have, um, names of your libraries, other, other relevant topics. So for open office, I'll say, here's an alert for Apache open office, here's an alert for open office. Misspell it. I mean, half the universe says open space office, so I, I, have, a, I have that set there as well. And that's a kind of a good way to figure out what the conversation at large is all about. So I guess a, a question from a hacker is kind of of all those lines of influence and all the different ways you have communicating to people, what are the most effective way? What's the best use of your time? Every project at Apache is going to have different numbers and maybe even different orderings for these. But this kind of gives you the idea of, you know, for a, a given, when you have a message to give, what's the most effective way to get it out? So if we put a post on our dev mailing list, we have around 500 subscribers. You know, that's the, the, the influence we get directly. If we post to Twitter, we have around 2,600 followers, you know, plus the potential for retweets. Obviously, not everyone reads their entire Twitter stream, but a lot of people might read everything that goes on the dev list. Um, if we go through, out through the Apache blog, you know, we get around 4,000 visits a day for a new post, and then it quickly trails off. If we, we have an announcement list that we have 9,000 subscribers to, so we can get a message out quickly there. If we post our Facebook page, we have 10,000 people who like open office, and then the potential for them to share. But where we really have the greatest ability to get a message out fast is on our homepage. Uh, we use the Apache CMS, and we use a template that, um, and if anyone saw it, um, Dave Fisher gave a, t a talk, a really nice talk on this yesterday. But we have the ability, and I want to just show you. W is for wonderful. Mm -hmm. See, I did learn something from marketing. Okay. No, don't have the network connection. Um, I'll describe it. On, on the top of each of the front page, we have the ability to put. Yeah. We'll, we'll get to that, and, and yes. It's kind of a community decision, but we can. So, uh, and, and in fact, that's how I know um, some of this data. So on the home page, we have a column that has all the tasks that you could do with OpenOffice. I want to learn more about it. I want to download it. I want to learn more about the community. I want to get support, et cetera. That's down one column. On the neighboring column, there's a set of news articles. And when there's a new thing, whether we're talking about something in the press or something of interest that we've written, we can put it there. On the homepage, we get 50,000 visits a day. We also have the ability through the CMS 
to put a one-line kind of headline announcement that will show up on the top of every single page on our website. And that gets around, if we do that, that gets around 200,000 visits a day. And the really interesting thing about that is 60% of it is, is via search, and that's why kind of search engine optimization is going to be an important part of you know, what, what we do with marketing. People aren't all going in and saying, I want to do something with OpenOffice, I'm going to type in www.openoffice.org and show up at our homepage and navigate from there. A lot of people are visiting, in fact, 60% kind of deeper down into the website. They're doing a search on, you know, OpenOffice, PDF export or whatever, and show up on a deeper down page. They'll never get that note, or very rarely, but they'll always get that one. Okay, so when you think of searches and kind of how people come to your website, just a, a rough way of thinking of it is, well, how does someone make a decision to use a software product or, or any other product, whether you're talking about, you know, a shoes, bicycle, automobile, whatever. You know, first they, they need to know that they have a need for the kind of thing that you have a solution for. Um, I mean, this is a big part of um, what advertisers do. Um, you, you think of, for example, at, at one point, People, people didn't use deodorant, underarm deodorant. Um, someone had to come up with the idea that said, this is a problem that you have and you need to solve it and we have a, prop, a, a product for it. So this Sorry. So there's need-oriented queries. So these would be things of people querying for things like free office, open source office, Microsoft Office replacement. They, they might not even know the name of your product or your project or even know that such a thing exists. All they know is kind of the symptom of what they're looking for. Yeah, if you want a supplement, I, I, I did set something like that up, and I, I can put it to you as for a supplement. And, and that's exactly, this is kind of a task I, I'd recommend to any project, is look at kind of the need-oriented ones, the research-oriented ones. These are ones where they're, they're trying to find out more about your product or some property of your pro product, like open office reviews, open office versus sympathy, open office deployments, and then action-oriented, which would be, you know, I have a crash with open office, I want to download open office. And it's really kind of brainstorm, put it on a wiki, figure out what the most probable queries people are going to make in these different categories, and see where you rate. You know, there are a lot of commercial tools that can help you with this, but if you want to do it for free, it's kind of crowdsource it with the, you know, volunteers in your community, put it on a wiki. Um, if you have significant numbers of users of your product who are, you know, querying in, in languages other than English, you know, make sure you, you know, get those search terms translated and make sure you, you find out whether you're relevant on other websites. You've probably heard that you know, getting the top spot obviously is, is important. Top three is important. If you're not in the top 10 for, for you know, an important search term, you're, you're pretty much invisible. And I'm sure, Lewis, you, you guys must have done in the old openoffice.org days a lot of optimization of this. I was just checking last night and found out that for the search term download, we're number nine. Yeah, and it's, I, I think, I wish more Apache projects when they were pod lanes kind of paid attention to this thing, because I think it's a critical when coming up for a name of a project. If, if the name of your project is really good web service, you know, 
good luck placing in, in search results. You, and I, a, lot, a lot of podlines come up with great names, but you really want it to be unique, not just from the trademark pers um, protection perspective, you know, the stuff that, that, that Shane will make you do, but you also want to think of it, is this something that people are going to spell correctly when they search for it, and, and kind of what's the, your, your search word kind of competitors at that point? Um, just, we just do it in Google, like we did a little bit of in Bing, but it was really just crowdsourcing it, just saying here's a list on a wiki, every, you know, one column, here it is in the US, here it is in Germany, here it is in Italy, here's the translation of the search queries and just having people manually just type it in and, and see how it ranks. Uh, the more better, the more data you can get, the better. Uh, the d but don't let the data determine ultimately what you're going to be doing because this is a shifting environment. Yeah, and it, I mean there are a lot of commercial tools out there that you'd have to pay for, and if you have a you know a sugar daddy for the project that's going to spend spend that money for it, then great. Otherwise, it's just a lot of manual work. And modern search engine optimization is not about key keyword stuffing and you know writing five line long you know. Um, meta descriptions in the HTML and stuff like that. It's really about having relevant content that speaks to, you know, these real world questions and issues that users have. I could give a whole talk on, on doing that, but I won't. Okay, Google Analytics, and there was a question about that. So, I said, how many people here have worked with Google Analytics? Okay, so I won't go too far into it. Um, there's another tool called Google Webmaster Tools that's probably less known, but it's good for kind of, it's good for diagnosing issues, you know, for, um, errors in your pages, missing titles, missing metadata descriptions, all sorts of various uh, anomalies of the website. They're constantly evolving. I, I used to know it really well, but, you know, it seems like in six months they're adding new stuff all the time. Um, the one thing I'd say from an Apache perspective, not speaking for Apache, but just my experience is, um, various teams have come up, especially in, in Podlings, and said, can we use Google Analytics? No one's ever said no. Um, it's pretty much been a community decision. One thing to watch out for within your community is the question of um, anonymization. Um, especially in Germany and, and there may be other places in Europe, they have data protection and data, you know, uh, anonymization rules that your community might require that you do this additional enhancement. And what this does is, you know, when you sign up for Google Analytics, you don't get tick by tick data for particular users. You get aggregated information. But in order for you to get aggregated information, Google must be able to get all the information. So you're required, if you do use Google Analytics, to put a privacy statement on your Apache website stating that you're, you know, using the, this particular Google Analytics service and you know, you have a cookie and kind of disclose to your users what you're doing. Not by default, but within a little bit of scripting, Google has a way of anonymizing the IP address by taking like the last octet of the address, kind of the most specific one, and just setting that all to zeros. And the effect for you would be, you know, you won't get as accurate city level data, but you know, the data will be more anonymous and, and that could be important for, for some communities. Okay, yeah. So some, some hacks, some specific things that, that we implemented in our Google Analytics to take care of um, you know, some problems that just out of the box, Google didn't handle that well. So I, I've heard a lot of Apache projects say, how many people have downloaded, how can we figure out how many people have downloaded our software? And you go to Infra and they'll say, no, you really can't do it because it's all sent out to the mirrors and we don't have any aggregate view of, of what the downloads are. Google Analytics, there is a way that you can kind of hack that and, and figure it out. And it's what's called um, a pseudo page view. And um, the idea is if you have a single page on your website that people go through then to click through to the mirrors, you can, um, well, take the sample right here. Google allows you via JavaScript to, say, track page view and treat the download 
as if it was a page. So you have a page called, you know, whatever foo.jar. And that's kind of how you do it. Um, an even simpler way of doing it, and you'll see the script there that we have in our SVN, um, it's based on an MIT licensed script, I forget who wrote it originally, but we modified it ourselves, called Entourage, and it will take the DOM of the web page as it loads, capture every link to a file of a specific set of extensions. So you can say jar tar zip, you know, if you want to track your, your, your signature file downloads, you can do that, et cetera. And it will automatically add that JavaScript you know, at, at page view time to it so you can track the page views. And so a, a really cool thing if you, you do that because you'll, you'll know automatically you know, what countries have the highest downloads. You know, everything through Google Analytics that you can do at a page level, you can now do for downloads. Okay, something we have in OpenOffice that not every project has, we have an in-product update feature. So once a week, someone who's running the OpenOffice client it will check a central server and say, is there a more recent version of OpenOffice? And if there is, they're prompted to, to then download it. Well, Google Anal Analytics is really great about tracking traffic that comes to your website from another website. It uses the HTTP you know, um, header and looks at the uh, referrer field, and it can kind of connect the dots of the web that way. But if you have something coming from outside a web browser, you know, from a, a link in an email, a link in, you know, a Twitter post, um, a link in, in this case, um, in, in product link, you can still help it connect the dots, and that's by defining something called a campaign. And you may have seen these type of things, the UTM source, UTM medium, UTM campaign all the time, sometimes in the links, and you may never, never really thought what they are. That's exactly what they are. Those are additional hints to Google Analytics that says, even though I don't know where this link came from, from a web perspective, this is a little bit of context that will tell me, in this case, this is an upgrade of someone upgrading from the 400 English US version coming from an open office client and they're doing an upgrade. So that's kind of another kind of powerful hack that you can do with it. Yes, um, we actually have a, a built-in level of indirection that when they do the update, they actually download an XML file from the server. So the XML file that they download from the server would have this information. But yeah, you, you have to have this kind of defined ahead of time. Um, the other thing, one thing we did with Apache OpenOffice is we, we wrote to the you know, fundraising you know, at apache.org and kind of said, could we have our own fundraising page? Not so we collect our own money. You, know, you can't do that at Apache. But we just thought, since most of our visitors to our website are end users, they're not developers, they're not large corporations, that we could rephrase the, the language of explaining how to donate and the benefits of donation stuff better if we targeted end users. Um, one thing we wanted to do is just get a sense for um, you know, how many donations were coming in and were they mainly coming through PayPal or Amazon, stuff like that. Same general idea. The link to make a donation is clicking out to a form outside of you know, apache.org. So Google Analytics won't give us any information directly. However, with a little bit of this JavaScript here, this track submissions, we can actually attach that to the on submit and get what's called an event. So the difference between a Google Analytics event and a pseudo page view is an event's not treated as a page view. So if you look at your overall page view total, it's not included there, but you can still get a lot of the same information. So we treat downloads like a page view when we count, but we treat clicking through to a donation differently. Okay. Um, how many people here are familiar with A-B experiments and, and websites? Okay. Just briefly, an A-B experiment is trying out different options of a website design or content in order to see which one performs best for, for some criterion, where a criterion could be which one, you know, which one leads the user to take the desired action. In a commercial context, it would be measured by sales. It could be signing up for a newsletter. It could be downloading OpenOffice. It could be making a donation to Apache. 
Um, in this case, we were doing A-B experiments to figure out the best placement of some social media links that we had on our website for people to kind of recommend open office to their friends. The problem is we were changing, trying radically different versions of the UI design, but the way the CMS is set up, it wants to make a very specific look and feel to every page. So we we're kind of fighting against the CMS. If you're using the CMS, just an easy thing to do is we had a, um, added just a pass through. So any HTML file that ends in pass through.html has a view in the view.pm, the action is just pass it through literally without any changes. And that was just a quick way that we could do the A-B experiments without kind of fighting the CMS. So the pass through ones aren't run through the CMS templating process, they're just treated literally. Um, another great tool out there to try I mean, the more information you can find about your users, their needs, their perceptions, their satisfaction level. Um, Lime surveys and open source PHP based, um, you know, survey management and survey design tool. And we've used that for everything from getting user feedback on, you know, new logo designs for the product to getting feedback from beta. We even have a link at the bottom of our website that just says feedback. You know, we don't publicize it all, it's just in the footer but it allows us to give you know, a few a day of people giving feedback on satisfaction with the website. Um, R, now you think I should be doing all the analysis that with Mark and I should be using OpenOffice Calc, of course. No, no. Calc's great for, for, for some things, but you use R because you're an engineer and you're not a marketing guy. It's, it allows you to do a lot more sophisticated analysis, but also allows you to set up a, a workflow. So we can do things like, I have a Python script that downloads all the statistics related to downloads into a big CSV file, and then I just load that into R and automatically produce updated graphics and export them to PNG files you know, with just a few clicks. Um, it's it's a, lot, a lot easier. Okay, I mentioned social sharing. This is that pathway of having users recommend your product to other users their friends. I mean, that's kind of a, a little bit of, you know, the, the social proof. If, if, if you go out there and you tweet, open office is wonderful, people are going to say, well, if I do it, they're going to say, who the hell is this guy? I don't know him. But if your friend says, open office is wonderful, try it, that's much more meaningful. So the question is, for the percentage of users that are enthusiastic about your product, what can you do to help them share the word? And what we did is we added on the home page. We have a little section here, you know, I want to stay in touch with OpenOffice, so there's a way for them to sign up, you know, essentially like our, our page on Facebook, which generates a little message to their friends that they liked it. And then we also have another part of the website, help spread the word, please tell your friends about OpenOffice. And when you click on that, you know, it kind of drafts a little tweet for them to, to send out. And we get, you know, dozens and dozens of these things going on a day. And of course, we're tracking them in Google Analytics. Do we have any, excuse me? Do you have any strategies that you build up? We kind of reinforce things. So if, in order to get, you know, we have 10,000 followers on Facebook. That didn't happen immediately. You're probably all familiar with, um, you know, how open, openoffice.org was with Sun and then Oracle, and then we had this kind of a messy period of time. The original openoffice.org Facebook account's not under our control. So we had to grow 100,000 or 10,000 followers from scratch, and we did that by putting in the front page of the website, follow us on Facebook. And then, so, so we kind of bootstrap things that way. Um, the one thing we did do, the placement of this and the design of this and the colors and kind of how that goes on the website, that was done based on a, a Google um, Analytics content experiment. So that was essentially tracing four different um, alternatives in an A-B experiment to find out which one led to the greatest number of likes. So, so we kind of optimize it that way. Um, a little subject that I had absolutely no knowledge of or respect for before I, I, I got involved with the marketing side of this. In copywriting, this is not the, the stuff we do in our license, this is the other type of copywriting, writing copy. And the challenge for us was, how do you communicate in a way which is truthful, honest, you know, in accordance with community values, 
in harmony with our nonprofit mission, but still is attention getting. You know, how do you cut through the noise and clutter, but you know, be authentic, but also savvy? And it's hard to do. Not all projects do that well. Some of them come, come off sounding very commercial. So what I just read up a little bit about it, and just an example of kind of something we did. You know, look to the masters. I mean, there are people that did this in a very savvy way way back. How many people have seen this advertisement? That's probably way before our time. But it's kind of a classic. I'll just read a little bit of it, because you probably can't see it. It's like, this, I think it's from like 1960 or 61. It says, this Volkswagen missed the boat. The chrome strip on the glove compartment is blemished. It must be replaced. Chances are you wouldn't have noticed it. However, Inspector Kirk Kruner did. There are 3,300 men on our Wolfsburg factory with only one job, to inspect Volkswagen, Volkswagens at each stage of production. 3,000 Volkswagens are produced daily. There are more inspectors than cars, et cetera, et cetera. And the big thing is, you know, lemon. That was heretical at the time to come up with an, an advertisement and copy that essentially said, here's an example of your product in kind of a disparaging way. But the overall message then is their preoccupation with quality and detail. You know, we pluck the lemons, you get the plums. So we had, with Apache Open Office 4.0, we had a release candidate this close to releasing. I think the vote had already passed, and some relatively new member of the pro project came up with a bug and reported it, and essentially brought the whole thing to a grinding halt. After we had already played up, you know, everyone expect the new release of 4.0 to come out. You know, this was a major release, our first major release really at Apache. Expect it the next day, and we had to kind of back off of that. Well, we kind of take that theme, and it led to this blog post. You know, Apache Open Office, 4.0 release candidate one build 9702 has been rejected. It was not good enough. Detlef and our German language community first noted the crash two days ago, which was passed on to the developers by Regina. We immediately started further testing to narrow down the problem. Samaritan Canada independently reported the crash a few hours later. We then determined that it crashed only on Windows 64-bit systems. Rob in the United States then worked with Herbert in Germany to find out where in the code the problem was. After a few more emails and chats, we had a proposed fix to test. As community members in Germany and North America slept, Yuzhen was testing the fix in Beijing, you know, et cetera, et cetera. And then we turned that into a message about the community. This is how a global community of volunteers produces quality open source software. There are skills required, technical and social, to coordinate, but also requires something more important, a dedication to equality. So it's essentially a ripoff of this 1960 Volkswagen one, but it's, it's very authentic, it's honest, expresses community values, harmony with a nonprofit mission, and it was very, very effective. I mean, the community was really pumped. I mean, who, who would think that people would be enthused about sending out something that says we screwed up? But it was, it was very effective, our users loved it, it, it gained them trust. So that's kind of the essence, essence of copywriting. Communicate sa you know, with savvy, but also authentically in accordance with community values. Okay, the press. And this is something that I'm probably the weakest on and still learning a bit about this. Okay, I'll go ahead. I'm I mean, we're always, when we're marketing, we're marketing two things. It's this duality of the product and the project. And we're, I think we're all always welcome and opening and looking forward to getting new volunteers, you know, new developers in all areas. But we also like to get more users. And we know there's a pyramid effect. If, if, if we had a million new users tomorrow, we know that some percentage of them would send in a good defect report, which would, we'd benefit from. Some percentage of them might send in a correction to a website or a patch you know, to documentation. And some even smaller percentage of them will volunteer to work on a translation or as a developer. So getting more users is how you get more developers. So 
So on, on the process, it's just kind of, for this is kind of just understanding what their constraints are and what they need and what they're looking for. And the press that we deal with is generally three categories. You know, occasionally there's you know, staff writers for, who do this kind of full time for a specific um, publication. There's a lot of freelance writers that will work with a whole range of um, online you know, tech journals. And then there's independent bloggers. And they're all looking for content. They're all looking for stories if it fits their beat. And this is where you have to do a little bit of research. Each of these journalists will have a web page, and they'll say, here's what I cover. And if, if they're looking more at it from you know, an enterprise software perspective, then, go, then don't go saying, you know, hey, we just got a translation of OpenOffice in, into Welsh. Because that's not going to be there, what they're going to cover. You really have to know kind of what's, what fits their beat, what's timely consumable, and what, just realize that the first route in news is new. It has to be something new. And what I've been doing with OpenOffice is kind of trying to get together a press contact list. And this is something that you kind of have to do a little bit in private. This is not something you put up on your, your public wiki. Um, it's kind of a little bit of an intelligence on who's covering your product. But just when it, based on your Google alerts, where you've kind of tracked everyone writing about your product, figure out who covers it regularly, who covers similar products, keep their names, their contact information. And just when you have something that you think is newsworthy, go down the list and try to say, who on this list would be you know, someone who would be interested in this article, get it out to them, you know, some information about it a few days ahead of time. And, and you know, you'd be surprised at, at how, how positive the reaction is sometimes. I mean, they're in the business of putting out news. They may give you negative reviews now and then, but, but they rely on having kind of this early notice on, on when something newsworthy is happening. Yeah. Yeah, it's that, that's 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 good advice. The, the other thing I, I look at, and you tell me whether this is true or not, but I read about it, so it must be true, is is, is kind of you know on the announcement side. When I first started writing blogs and stuff, I was very much like I was writing a mystery. You know, it was kind of like the little tease that doesn't quite tell you what the story is about in the first paragraph, it just sets the mood. And then you tell a little bit and you kind of carry them along. And then in paragraph eight at the very end, you say, this is what I've been meaning to talk about. That's not the way um, someone who does this for a living wants to see it. Just a typical random story I just took out of a local paper. Um, Biden to talk jobs training in New Hampshire on Tuesday. And the whole idea of a lot of these articles is think of it as a spiral. You could in terms of increasing level of information, but wherever you stopped in this article, you'd pretty much have a complete story of, of the overview of it. So even if you just read the headline, Biden to talk jobs training in New Hampshire on Tuesday, you know something. Read one more paragraph, you know a little bit more. It repeated, I mean, this is redundant. I was never taught to write redundantly. I, I would never have done that when I started blogging, but then I realized that's important. So you're repeating Vice President Joe Biden is heading to New Hampshire, an important state in the presidential nomination, to discuss on the job drug training. The next paragraph tells a little bit more. And when you think of it, the way a newspaper set out, you have these columns, you have each of these articles. Someone's going to scan through looking for something of interest. They don't have all day to read every word in the whole paper. Kind of be respectful of the reader and give them the information, try to get as much information as you can, as early as you can in the article when you're writing it. Okay. Gotcha. I mean, was that, did you do that through Sun, or? Okay. 
Yeah, I haven't had as much luck with analysts. Like, I, I think a lot of them have kind of this relationship where, you know, they're also selling kind of consulting related to, so the company's paying them for information and then giving them information. So it's, it's, it may be harder to engage as an open source project, but. How much time do I have? Now you're just at five minutes. Five minutes. Yeah, before I summarize, I mean, just, I mean, that, that's pretty much the presentation. I'm wondering, does anyone else have kind of any useful hints kind of along the lines of you know, marketing and open source for hackers, you know, things that fit within the Apache way of doing things that you'd like to share? Yeah, just uh, two things. One on the new style writing, um, headlines matter for more than one reason. One, because you're competing with a whole bunch of other headlines, so you've got to get someone's attention. Uh, and it also matters for SEO. Um, so you, you don't keyword stuff, but it does matter for SEO. Um, and then going back to social media, because I spend a lot of time doing social media, um, it, it takes resources. So you've got to make some decisions. Are, am I going to spend my time on Twitter? Am I going to spend my time on Facebook? Or have a 50-50 shot at both of them? And so it, you know, with your traditional project management triangle, you've got time, money, and resources, and you've got to figure out which ones you're going to use to be most effective. Uh, and use your analytics to help you figure out what those could be. Um, we, uh, so I run opensource.com, and we had great success with Twitter up front. We have, still have great success with Twitter. But over the last four months, our Facebook likes have like quadrupled. We went from about 20,000 to almost 50,000. Um, and we didn't do anything different. I don't know how, many, how, how legitimate some of those are, but um, you know, we, just start, we just started being like a Facebook person. Like we would just put pictures up there and put interesting stuff. It, it is, right? So we experiment. We say, hey, we're going to try doing three a day. Do we get, is it, does it move the needle? Uh, and so metrics, like measuring your stuff, is also extremely important. So whatever you do, you've got to be able to have something that's measurable. We do a lot of smart goal type stuff where... Yeah. <laughs> You know, I'd, I'd say one other thing is keep in mind who you're trying to reach. And, and this will be, depend on your project, how long it's been around, how well it's already known. Open Office, I'm pretty sure everyone at this conference has heard of it before they walked in the door, and pretty much everyone who's involved in open source knows Open Office. They're not who we're necessarily trying to reach in terms of getting new users, but we, we reach them for other reasons, you know, for giving project updates. One reason we have an emphasis on, say, Facebook rather than Google Plus is for you know the ordinary new user who's may never have may not even know the word open source or what it means. Um, to reach them, we find it's most effective on Facebook. My mother's not on Twitter; she's on Facebook. So, so if you want to reach my mother, you know that that's kind of where you do things. Um, but for a more tech crowd, you're probably going you know on Google Plus and and, and Twitter. You know, to get, to get the kind of the developer audience. Any other questions or comments or ideas? Okay, so just kind of in summary is, you know, we started off looking at the different paths of influence, looking at communities, users, product, press, and just find out based on your own circumstances and what type of volumes you get in, in various ways, you know, what are the most effective paths to influence. We found out just based on the dynamics of, of kind of our product and projects that, you know, a key part of it was announcements on the home page and social media. Use the most effective tools so you can concentrate on the code. Um, hopefully you, you caught a few techniques here. And the, the other thing is the importance of tuning the message you know, for the audience.
Yeah, it's, it's somewhat limited. I don't speak Japanese, and we don't have anyone on the marketing side that does. But, but if I can bring this in, and it may not show it depend, depending on the hour, and you look at the refers to our page, we, there is this social media site or some site in Japan that's a huge referrer of traffic to us, and we're totally unengaged with, with, with that stream of traffic. I also notice a lot of stuff on Twitter that comes through in Japanese, and, and, and it doesn't engage with us. So yeah, I mean, we, we should really grow the effort, get more people involved. Um, and that's another topic is how do you share, you know, in a multi-user system, how do you share Twitter and Facebook accounts and stuff like that? It's kind of, you know, do you do it to allow any committer to do it or only have PMC members have kind of access to the accounts, stuff like that. You know, and it just see if it shows up on the refers. Yeah, so they're saying like, like right now, 740 people on the website. Okay, not that high just because of the time zone right now. But I don't know what this cheek the cord is. Yeah, it might be. Yeah, no, I mean it's night time. I, I do see the referrals from Yandex, and yeah, I mean the growth. I mean, you think of it just in terms of the population of the world. If if we really wanted to take an end-user software and grow it, it's not necessarily in the U.S. It's going to be growing it in India and Indonesia, and, and you know China. Yeah. Okay. Thanks, everyone. Yeah. Let's thank Rob for a great talk. Oh, thanks.